My name is Dr. Leonie Fleischmann. I am co-chair of Mazorti Judaism, and I'm also a lecturer in international politics at City University of London, where I research, amongst other things, uh, what's going on in Israel. But I'm not the main speaker for today. Don't worry, we have our actual expert who's going to take us through what's going on in Israel to try and unpack why it is that Israel is going to the fourth election in two years. What is the state of play? What are the potential outcomes? So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce Anshel Pfeffer, who is a senior correspondent for Haaretz and also the Israel correspondent for The Economist. And he's also written a book on Bibi, on Bibi Netanyahu, called Bibi, the triumphant life and times of... Uh, turbulent, turbulent. Turbulent, turbulent times of... Um, <laughs> Preempting a turbulent times of um, Netanyahu, life and times of Netanyahu. And it's a really pleasure that he's with us today to help us try and understand um, what's going on. So thank you very much, Anshel, for joining us. The way this is gonna work is for about 20 minutes, I'm gonna ask um, Anshel a few questions, um, kind of get us all onto the same page with what's going on. And then there'll also be 20 minutes for, um, well, open it to the floor for you to ask any questions that you might have. So welcome, Anshel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And it's an, it's an honor to join Masati Judaism. Um, just full of what you've been doing. Great. You're, you're cutting out a little bit, but hopefully it'll be OK. Yeah. OK, hopefully it'll be joining better us from, as we go. Joining us from far away in Israel. The yeah. Can you see me now? Yes, that's OK. Yeah. Let's, let, let's try and make as much time as we have from what we have. Come on. Great. So let's just start. Can you just give us a bit of a lay of the land? What is currently going on? So obviously on February the 4th, the parties um, selected, um, submitted their candidate lists. What have things looked like since then? Give us a bit of a introduction. So as I'm sure everybody knows, the, the election on March 23rd is the fourth in a series of four elections in less than two years, a pretty uh, crazy and deadlock situation in which Israeli politics has been for over, for over two years now. And the main reason that we're in this, in this deadlock, in this stagnated and impossible political landscape is that we have a, 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 not, a very unusual breakdown of the parties. If you, in the, Israel is, it, you know, has proportional representation and coalition governments, which have always coalesced some way around ideological and political uh, shared interests, where you, in, re in recent decades, there was the religious parties working with the right wing. In previous decades, the religious parties worked more with the center left, but you had these more or less, uh, more or less coherent polls and uh, uh, and 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 the uh, coalitions working together with each other, and it was, it 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 made sense in some way, and it worked for you know you you got the, every election, you got the answer, you got the the conclusion coming from you, know, you got the results, and the coalitions got together, and finally there was an election. I'm seeing have a bit of a problem here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, good. So. Um, What's changed in the last two years is that the old system of blocks, the left block, the center block, the right block, the religious block, have broken down under new lines. Suddenly, Israeli politics is divided between two blocks, the Netanyahu block and the not Netanyahu block. And for the first time, it's, it's not about uh, what are the shared interests of the parties and what are the shared ideologies and platforms and manifestos of the parties, but how the parties, which parties will agree even to sit under Benjamin Netanyahu and serve in a government and which parties say will never sit with him for various reasons to, to do with his legal issues, to do with the way he's conducted business over recent years, his trustworthiness and, and even a general argument that he's just been Prime Minister for so long, it's time for Israel to change. And what we're seeing in this present, or this number four of the series, is that this, we've really reached 
the, the peak of yes Netanyahu, no Netanyahu, he was rak lo bibi or, 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 or rak bibi. And we, we actually have parties of the right wing, which are identical to Likud. We have the new party, New Hope, by Gideon and Sarah. It's a, it's a Likud twin. Most of the politicians there were in Likud, have been in Likud for many years. The, the, the positions and manifesto of the parties identical was to Likud's manifesto over many years. But there's one thing, Gideon Sar and his colleagues in New Hope say, we can't serve under Netanyahu. He is, he's basically ruined Likud, he's made it into his personal platform and he's running the country for his own personal interest and to get out of his, his, his corruption trial and therefore we're not sitting with him. And this is a reflection of the entire political scene because we now actually have parties which in the past you would have said would have never have sat with Netanyahu. For example, we have, we have now Ra'am, an Islamist party, an Arab Islamist party, say, actually we may sit with him. So we have, we have a breakdown of the old political system, which is caused by the predicament of one man. There are also wider social divides, which it also is reflecting. But right now, the main issue is whether or not Netanyahu will remain prime minister after these elections. And that is the, that's the defining, the be all and end all issue right now of Israeli politics. And that's the reason why we're stuck in this endless cycle, because Netanyahu doesn't have a majority. There, there's less than a, a majority of Israelis want to replace Netanyahu, and a majority of Israelis vote for parties which are against Netanyahu. However, because of this ideological breakdown, the parties of the opposition to Netanyahu, even though they have a majority in the previous in the, in the previous two Knessets, and according to the polls, they'll have a majority again after March 23rd, can't work together because they're strong across the political. Uh, um, the, 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 the whole political uh, range of parties from the far right, we have anti Netanyahu parties in the far right, like Lieberman, Israel, Beitano, and Neftali Benz, Yamina, all the way to the left and to the Arab. We have the Communist Party, which is part of the joint list. So, all the way from right to left, the opposition is strung across the spectrum and can't really coalesce, even though on paper they have a majority. And that's what's sticking Israeli politics. And if the polls are anything to go by, we'll, we'll remain stuck after March 23rd. Not very hopeful right now. <laughs> Thank you. So are you suggesting that there's an unlikely that there's going to form a stable government despite the changes that have actually happened in this round of elections? Or do well, you think there is a potential for something to come from this? No, the mathematics have changed very much as they are. What has changed is that now the impetus for replacing Netanyahu is coming as much from the right, and even more even from the right, than it was coming from the centre-left. So the real question is, will there be enough parties which will be able to cooperate, despite their ma major differences in a Netanyahu coalition, or will Netanyahu do better than the polls are currently predicting and have a majority? In either case, there could be a coalition, but to call it stable, I think, would be a bit of, a, a bit of an exaggeration. Right. And clearly, you know, you're an expert on Netanyahu, um, given, given your book. How is it that he has managed to survive this long, despite the various controversies in his, um, in his financial life, in his private life? And there's also been this rising protest since the summer, um, people going out onto the street calling for, and, you know, anti-BB, exactly as you said. But how is, he, is it that he has simply lasted so long? Well, there are... I mean, there are a few aspects, asked a number of questions. But, sorry, uh, I cut that for a moment. I'll, I'll start again. Uh, there are a few aspects to your question, is, and it's actually more than one question, because first of all, you asked, how has he stayed on for so long? Being a prime minister of any country is a tough job. And he's been a prime minister now for uh, a total of over 14 years. So first question is, why is he staying on for so long? Few prime ministers in electoral systems, and some I, I, you could call Israel a democracy, it's only a limited democracy, but few prime ministers stay on for so long. And one of the reasons is that the man has a burning sense of historic destiny. He is convinced that he's the man, the only man who can make sure that Israel is safe. And if anyone else was to be prime minister of Israel, Israel will be hurtling towards this disaster, and that's a very uh, ego, yeah, very egomaniacal thing to, to believe. But that's what Bibi believes. Bibi believes 
that he is the savior of Israel and he needs to stay on. And he has this incredible sense of destiny and he, that he needs to do it. And, you know, to be a leader of a country, you have to be pretty crazy. You're someone who gets up in the morning and all your decisions can decide lives of thousands, perhaps millions of people. And then there's a lot of responsibility and you need a lot of, you need a lot of chutzpah to be able to do that kind of job. And Bibi has that in, incredible, he has this inexhaustible reservoir of this, of, of this self-confidence that I really have never seen anybody else, including in some of the most senior politicians, not, not just Israel, but around the world. And politicians, as we know, don't lack in ego. But he really has that more than anyone else. Second of all, he is a very, very talented, very resourceful politician and campaigner. Now, we know about politicians that they, they, they all smile on the campaign trail. But the truth is that when, they're, you know, when, when the cameras are no longer on, when they're back at home at the end of a long day of campaigning in elections, they just can't wait for it to be over for the elections to be over and for them to get be able to start governing and to doing the real business of politics. But Netanyahu is a campaigner. He comes alive. He's just, just like no other politician I've ever seen. He comes alive during elections. He games out every scenario at the beginning of the campaign. He works every edge he can. And he comes alive in front of the crowd in the campaign videos. And even when there's not an official election campaign, he's already fighting the next campaign because he's a constant campaign. I mean, Netanyahu's, uh, uh, the secret of Netanyahu's success is the constant campaign. He's always fighting the election. When other politicians are thinking, now we can rest a bit, Netanyahu's already thinking how he's going to fight the next election. He's already preparing ideas. He's preparing strategies. He's making alliances. He's breaking old alliances. He's constantly in the race. It's it's a bit like you know one of those uh, you know Ar Arabian horses that you see or the thoroughbred horses that you see who can't wait to get into the stalls and start the race. That you know, that's how Netanyahu functions. So that's another reason. And you asked you asked another question, which was in that question, which was how has he remained for so long despite the corruption trial? And what what he's done is that over the years he's made this about not just about himself. In the sense that he's um, he's personalized his only the party and all the issues, but he's made it him against the the legal system. And if any Israeli has some kind of resentment against the legal system, and many Israelis sadly do, because the legal system is seen by too by too many parts of Israel as being part of a of a secular elite, and not necessarily on the side of minority groups, on the side of religious groups. And also we have to note, also the Palestinian Israelis don't feel the legal system is on their side. But Netanyahu has managed to gather a lot of these groups together in their resentment against the legal system and build this myth of a devious left-wing deep state, which is just out to get here. And this is all a witch hunt. And a lot of the people on, a lot of right-wingers who, who will be voting for Netanyahu or for other parties supporting Netanyahu don't necessarily believe in his personal uh, case. A lot of them will say, yeah, we know he's corrupt, but they believe in the campaign against the, against the courts, against the, ju the judicial system, against the, the, the state prosecution, because they see them as being a bigger enemy, so they're happy to work with Netanyahu. And this is what he's done over the years. He's, you know, he's built this coalition of resentment of, of, of people who, who feel underdogs. Now, it's ridiculous to, 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 for the right-wing religious coalition in Israel to see themselves they've been in power and they for now for so long. But that is how Netanyahu keeps them in power by stoking the resentment. And part of stoking the resentment is also turning them against the courts. And, and, his, and in this case, it's also important for him personally. And he asked about the protest. I, ha I hate to say it, but the protest, which is a very, uh, you, I'm assuming you mean the, the Balfour protests outside Netanyahu's, uh, for, for, for British Jews, Balfour, is the man who signed the piece of paper which ostensibly helped Israel. So I, I don't believe in that. I think that Britain didn't really do very much. But, uh, but for Israelis, Balfour is the name of the street where the prime minister's house is. And the Balfour protests have been, I think now for 37 weeks running, a uh, very colorful, very, uh, also quite angry at some point, protest against Netanyahu's corruption, calling here for him to leave. But I'm not sure that that's in itself a political power. It's certainly, uh, an outpouring of anger and manifestation of 
of those who are really uh, adamantly opposed to him. But at the end of the day, it's not a big group and I don't think they're changing things. And in some ways, they're actually helping Netanyahu because they're externalizing the, the, the notion this is all about him. It's all about him against the left wing. And they've even given the right wing sort of a rallying point to, to support Netanyahu. So, I mean, I don't want to run down the protest. I think they're, they're, they're playing a role, but they're certainly not uh, a threat, at, the, at least at this point. Maybe if Netanyahu goes further, if he wins, and if he tries to actually close down the attorney generals and the state prosecutor offices and not let them continue the trial against him, perhaps the nucleus, the, the core of Balfour protesters, could grow into something much larger, but it's not a mass protest. It looks quite massive when you, you know, anybody who's been to, to, to the Paris Square, which is next to Balfour Street, it's actually a tiny square. So, you know, if you fill the square with a couple of thousand people, it looks like 50,000 people in Trafalgar Square. It's not there yet, but who knows? Hopefully, hopefully there won't be a need for the Balfour protest to, to, to do that. Hopefully the, it'll, it'll happen through the polls. So think, to, talking about the polls then, maybe thinking, looking a bit more forward in terms of what potentially could happen. You mentioned that the real difference this time around is that it's not a left-right split and that the right has really fragmented even more with Gidon Saar and the New Hope Party splitting away from Likud. Is there potential for Gidon Saar and his party to be a real challenger um, against Netanyahu? And if not him, are there any key personalities that could come through as the potential new prime minister? Well, Gidon Saar is certainly a challenger, and this, that's how he's been, you know, he's now portray, portraying himself. The real question is, can four or five or six, probably six parts of the opposition work together? And for that to happen, they really need this nucleus of, of parties to coalesce around one leader. Now, Gideon Sao is a potential leader, but so could Yair Lapid be, and he's coming from the center. So could Naftali Bennett, if the right constellation of, of opposition parties works out. And it's very difficult at this point to really predict who's going to have the upper hand within the opposition uh, after the election. And like I said, even if Netanyahu doesn't have his majority, which right now the polls are saying he won't, he'll still, you know, he'll still miss, he'll still have a chance of staying on if the opposition can't get behind one figure. Now, Gideon Sar has some of the abilities to bring that coalition together, but he's also very right wing. So he may not be the, the kind of person, he's certainly not the kind of person that Labour and Merits want to sit with from the left. They may decide that they have no choice, or maybe Gideon Sar can bring in what can cause one of Netanyahu's allies to defect, perhaps Shas or you know, Doha Judaism, to defect to his coalition. But really, this is you know, these are questions that we can't really answer now until we have a better idea in three and a half weeks of what the lay of the land is. Okay, great. And I, I would just want to ask you before we open it up a little bit about what's going on in the left. Um, we've got a new... <laughs> what left exactly? Uh, new Labour chairwoman with Marav Mikaeli, um, but clearly dwindling numbers over the years in terms of um, the strength of the left and also their ideology. What exactly are they promoting? So I was wondering if you could give us a bit of an idea of what the left looks like and if there has been any changes this time round that might suggest that the left is on its way to returning or whether we're just seeing a further decline um, in, in that side. Well, one thing I think people should always bear in mind when you talk about the Israeli left is that if you refer to the Labour Party that was once in power as the Israeli left, it's a bit of a misnomer. The Israeli left was never really a left-wing party. It was always very centrist, very security-minded. It's in the, certainly in the early decades believed in socialism, but he believed in socialism more as a as a means to an end, that end being founding and securing the Jewish state rather than socialism as an ideal of a global uh, re, uh, reallocation of, of resources and so on. It, it, was a very, it was a very functional, very pragmatic socialism that this is the best way to build the Jewish state and to secure it, it's through socialist Zionism. But it wasn't left-wing in any of the, almost in any of the senses you have in the UK, except that yes, it believes, and it still does believe in universal health care and, uh, and, and, and education and so on, but it's not a left-wing 
in the in the more modern sense. So the Israeli left has actually always been the parties to the left of Labour, and it's always been pretty small. But if you do broaden the the idea of the Israeli left and, and include Labour, what happened to Labour is Labour's basically lost out to centrist parties. Going back to 1977, when it was Dash, which basically took most of Labour seats away and allowed Likud to, to go to get the power, until this day, which is in what we have, Yesh Atid, and we had Kahol Avan, Benny Gantz's party, Blue and White, who are basically centrist parties taking the, the mantle of Labour as the main centrist party. And, and, and the reasons for that happening is because Labour sort of didn't have a very good leadership for many years. Labour lost its sense of identity. What was it? You know, at the moment, it wasn't a state building party because the state had already been built and secured. Then what was Labour? And then Labour wanted to be the party of peace in the 1990s with Oslo, but then the Oslo process collapsed in the second intifada from 2000 onwards. So what is Labour? So Labour never really managed to reinvent itself. And until very recently in the polls, it was even below the electoral threshold of 3.25%, meaning it wouldn't have even had a representation in the next Knesset. Merav Michaeli, as you mentioned, is the new, the new uh, chairwoman. She uh, just a, a month ago was elected uh, in a landslide. Which was very impressive, though I have to admit that there weren't really many, many, many other alternative candidates of any with any uh, public recognition. But Mirab Michali has very quickly breathed, uh, breathed some life back into into Labour. She's a very good campaigner. She's a very compelling uh, public figure. She's managed to pull Labour back up over the the threshold. Still, only a single digit figure, six or seven seats. And another thing has happened that she seems to have taken some of those seats, some of those votes, away from Labour's left-wing sister party, Merit. So now the question, Merit, which was which was polling around six or seven seats, is now polling around four or five seats. And, and there's a worry that Labour will, sorry, that Merit will drop below the threshold. Now, the truth is that where are all those votes? Not in Labour, not in Merit. They're in Yesh Atid and they're in blue and white. Those are the old school center-left vote, who've lost hope in Labour, and maybe Mary Micheli, if, if she has the time, because Labour leaders nowadays last for two years on average, and then they're thrown out by the party members. It's not a very uh, not a very leader-friendly party for the last couple of decades. But if Mary Micheli's got given a chance, and if perhaps the centrist parties don't really succeed in delivering, which is usually happens with centrist parties, they don't last very long, then there's a chance that the Labour can come back. But what thing they have to do, and they haven't done yet, and I could go on another, another two hours about what Labour needs to do, but is really come up with a new narrative. Because Labour hasn't, I mean, Mara Mikhail says, I'm in the way of Rabin. What does that mean? Is the Rabin, which Rabin? The Rabin were, there were different incarnations of Rabin over the years. What was Rabin's positions before, after Oslo? I mean, all these things are, are slogans. I, I think Mara Micheli knows what she wants to do with Labour, but right now she's got to like, just perform a life-saving operation to keep Labour alive. And hopefully after that, if she succeeds, maybe she'll have some time, or maybe she'll be allowed the time also to take Labour back to being, if not a party of power, at least a party which is a, a, a bit more than six or seven seats in the Knesset. Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, I have plenty more questions that I would love to pick your brain on, but I think it's only fair to open it up um, to the floor. So the way we'll do this, if you have a question, if you um, either put a reaction on your um, on your um, tile, put up your physical hand or write in the chat and I will call on you to unmute. So if you have a question, please make yourself known in whichever way is easiest for you. So we have a question from Andrew Bowman. So I'm going to unmute you, Andrew. Thank you, Leonie. Uh, and thank you, Anshel. It's very interesting. I enjoy reading your um, columns in all those publications, including anonymously, The Economist. I didn't realize you were the, uh, the voice there of Israel or of the reporting. A uh, quick question. I, I lived in Israel myself for many years. I used to be involved in trying many, many years ago to get things like electoral reform uh, during my student days, and I'm going back 40 years, um, would a system, there is a systemic problem here too. Um, to what degree do you um, see that as soluble by um, some changes like the electoral system 
or do you feel politics is just too fractured now for this to make any difference at all? Well, you know, in the other room, there's Stephen Bush, who is a big fan of proportional representation like we have in Israel. Uh, and, you know, people keep saying, look at Israel, it's not such a great idea. But I, look, I agree, Andrew, it, it, it's a, there is a systemic problem, but the systemic problem we have right now is, is not the same problem that we used to have in Israel. Because if you look, we're now, this is now the election for the 24th Knesset. So Israel's held already 23 general elections, parliamentary elections. And in the first 20, it may have been ugly, but a result was reached. And the, and the governments didn't always last for their full term, but they last for, on average, for two, for two and a half years. So they delivered something reasonable. It wasn't great. The, the system, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I think Rabin once said that the coalition building is like, it's like the, the proverbial sausage factory. Everybody likes to eat the sausage, but nobody wants to see how they're made. And that was what coalitions uh, were. And that's what coalitions are. And I don't think there is um, that much of an alternative in it, it, with, with Israeli society. If you want the very many different tribes, groups, communities, call them what you will, to feel that they're represented. So I think that the Israeli system does work for Israel, except right now, because right now we have this really bad period in which it's all become personalized, it's all become about Netanyahu, it's just become so splintered that to say the system doesn't work, yes, the system isn't working right now, but I think we're going to have to have some kind of catharsis which will come with the end of the Netanyahu era. May it come soon, but whenever it's gonna come to see if the system can't go back to working. And I agree, it wasn't perfect before, but no electoral system is. I mean, we can point to problems with, the, with, with Britain's first past the post system and problems with America's electoral college. In the end, the country sort of works out the system that somehow works for it, even if it doesn't, if it's not always perfect. So just short, yeah, try to sum it up. I think the system can work, can go back to work. We won't know until we're out of this really, deep rut, the Netanyahu rut of the last couple of years. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, have another conversation. In another, hopefully there'll, there'll be a change of government and another election will only be in four or five years and then we can talk then if the system is working any better. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got some more questions here, which are which are asked, and I think you know, in some ways, they are related to this question about the coalition and how a coalition can um, survive for longer than it has done in the past few years. So the first one is around Gantz. Um, so from Jeannie Horowitz, why did Gantz fail? Was this inevitable? Wow. Uh, why did Gantz fail? I mean, look look how fast it's happened. A year ago, he was still the leader of the largest party in the Knesset. Now. He is teetering on the, on, the, on the electoral threshold. Some of his closest friends and actual comrades in arms are writing open letters. Benny, drop out of the race. And he's responding very hurt, saying, you're shooting me in the back instead of giving me cover. I mean, this, is, this kind of shows why Gantz failed. Gantz joined politics when the, when the Israeli political scene was, was, was just looking for a savior, someone to end the Netanyahu era. He was the white knight, the tall, white-haired, blue-eyed general who wasn't really left and wasn't really right and seemed to be clean because he'd never been in politics. And he was the perfect answer. So he's really voted for him. And he wasn't the perfect answer because politics is a profession. And if you're going to take on the, the super professional of all times, the, the all, you know, I can't give it to, enough superlatives. A man who, who combines Margaret Thatcher with Tony Blair and is, is, is as, 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 as good a campaigner as, as any campaign you've ever seen. If you're gonna take him on, you're gonna be a good politician. And Gans just did not and doesn't have those capabilities. You can say a lot of good things about him, but in politics, you're tested in a way you're not tested on the battlefield. It's a different kind of battlefield. It's much more toxic in many ways. He was a brave soldier. He's, I think, he's a decent man, but he's just not cut out to be a politician. That's the short, that's the short answer. I think I'll take the liberty of adding what I what, what I think a little bit about Gantz in the sense that he 
he went into bed with Netanyahu and I think a lot of his voters weren't happy about that and I think as a, and I personally think that that's affected him in the fallout um, between um, that election and this election. Um, I'm going to hand over, so and hi Benzion, you had your hand. Really the question is why he made that mistake and his, mis and his mistake was taking on a politician when he's not a politician. But you're, you're, quite, I, I, you're quite right, Leon. I mean, that breaking that pact with his voters was was the was the beginning of the end, and there was no coming back from that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Haim Ben Sion. Had his hand up. Just unmute. Oh, there you go. Hi, Angel. Um, fantastic take on the elections. Um, I'm in the Haria just down the road from you, mate. Uh, question. Um, do you think that Yael Lapid and Yeshatid have any chance at all in the elections? And, and what's your take on his friendship with Bennett? Uh, well, I think that Yael Lapid has his best chance now of, of becoming prime minister. Is that a good chance? Hard to say, but this is the best chance he'll get. He's, you know, he's been for now. Right in the crux of things. Anshel, have you disappeared? You're now muted, Anshel. So if I ask you to unmute, uh, okay. there you go. you're back. You know? You're back, yes. Sorry about that. I'll start from the beginning of the answer. It's a to Chaim's question. This is the best chance that Yale is ever going to have. He's been for nine years in politics. We, I, I said before about how centrist parties don't usually last very long. Yes, Atid has lasted for nine years. It's a phenomenal achievement for Yale Lapid, keeping the party where it is. And now in the polls, he's clearly the second largest party. Looks like that will stick until the, until the actual election. And he's positioned not too badly because he's got two or three right-wing parties to the right, a couple of left-wing parties to his left. I'm not going to mention, I mean, a joint list probably will not be a candidate to be in the coalition because the right-wing won't sit with them. But he's still conceivably in the polls, is at the center of a block of about 61, 62 seats. So on paper, he's now in pole position to replace Netanyahu. It's on paper. Because at the end of the day, there are so many machinations of what, what Gideon Sarr and Naftali Bennett can do to him. And it's true, Naftali Bennett and him have worked well together. They worked in the, in the, two, in the 2013 coalition. They basically gave Netanyahu an ultimatum, take both of us into your government or don't, or you won't have a government. I'm not sure that eight years later, they still have that level of relationship. Bennett has his own... Um, has his own ambitions, and, and it's not about Bennett and, and Lapid talking to Bibi together, it's about Lapid working out which one of them can be a prime minister. I'd say that there are three potential prime ministers to replace Netanyahu, it's Naftali Bennett, Gidon Sir, and Yair Lapid. I say Yair Lapid has got the best chance of the three, but not by a huge margin. It very much depends on what the other people do, whether, for example, whether Lieberman will throw in his lot with, with, with Lapid, which is, is, look, we may have sort of an axis, a Lapid-Lieberman axis against the bennett Sarah axis, depends which of those two pairs of parties have more seats. But like I said, this is Lapid's best chance. Will he, can he grasp it? There's also, let's not forget, there's a good chance that if, even if Netanyahu loses, the next prime minister will not have a full term, but will have to just, split up the term with someone else. So Lapid could be the next prime minister, but he may have to uh, split the term with Sa'ar or with Bennett. Who knows, maybe even a three-way split. It'll each have a year and a half or something like that in office. But I think Lapid has a chance, his best chance yet, but uh, he's still going to work very hard. And he's playing a very clever campaign. He's doing a very low profile He's working, he's, he, he, he told me that they, I'm doing retail politics. I'm going to meet people in the street. He's not doing the street, he's doing it over Zoom, but he holds every day eight or nine Zoom meetings, every time hundreds of people, and they're grueling, they're asking questions. And Billy, I, I know we're all, we're all sick and fed up of Zoom, not this, obviously not this event, this is a great event, but we're all sort of sick and fed up with Zoom. And Lapid is putting in the hours every single day. Who knows, it may work. 
Great. We have quite a lot more questions in only five minutes. So let's see how many we get through. And really apologies if we don't get through all of them. Um, and I'm just going to take one from Ian who asks, is there a chance that there could be a coalition without the Haredi parties? Sorry, coalition without what, sorry? The Haredi parties, the religious right. Yeah. Um, you know, we have, uh, uh, I just said a Lapid or a Sao coalition could could have it could include five, six or seven parties without Haredi parties. It could have uh, it could have Israel, Israel Beteinu, uh, New Hope, Yamina, Yeshatid, Labour merits. That should be enough for a coalition, or a blue and white if they get through. That could that could be a coalition without Haredi parties. Will it happen? Who knows? But it's a possi it's a possibility. There certainly is a major groundswell of opinion in Israel which does not want to see a Haredi party in the next coalition. About sixty something, sixty something, sixty eight percent or something. I'm, 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 you know, that's not the right number. But about two thirds of Israelis don't want to see the Haredi in the next coalition because they don't like Haredi, and because everything that's happened last year with coronavirus and the, the way the Haredi community has flouted much of the much of the restrictions and it's a possibility once again who knows right lots of lots of who knows it seems yeah. um <laughs> but we've got um so we've got a question here from david kaplan what are the implications of the election for prospects of meaningful engagement with the palestinians that's an easy question to answer none as it has been for quite some time i would i would say as well I mean, um, well, it's, then, it's, not an issue. it's so not an issue. It's not even an issue, issue for the joint list, which you would expect for them to be bringing these things up. It's just not there right now. These elections are about two things, Netanyahu and COVID. And that's it, really. Um, so we've got a question. Perhaps there's some kind of optimism to the future, or perhaps not, depending on your answer. But from I Benson, how optimistic are you about the future of democracy in Israel? Clearly, part of the protests that we mentioned, even though you said they're quite small right now, it's been about democracy and about kind of increasing waves of anti-democratic legislation in the past years. Is Israeli democracy on the on the kind of struggling, or is there a future for Israeli democracy? I am very optimistic, and I'll tell you why. And I don't want this to sound like some kind of Zionist Federation, rah, 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 we love Israel. But, I, but, but I'm seriously now, Israel is a limited democracy. We know the democracy ends at the green line where it becomes a military occupation. So, and it's, it's so far from being perfect in so many other ways as well. But there is, I don't know where it came from because, you know, 90 something percent of Israelis their parents were not born in democratic countries. They, they, I mean, uh, my parents moved from Manchester to Israel, but most <clears throat> British, most Israelis are not British, are not British, and they're not American. Most came from Eastern Europe and from North Africa. And yet, you know, we said before, this is the twenty-fourth election, and people are engaged, and people are talking about it despite Corona, and people really believe that the elections can change something, and that, and that's a level. Of engagement, and this is also something that, that that political scientists measure. One of the things that Israel is very good at is the level of engagement of the of the the general population in the election, and it's very high in relative to other countries. And that gives me hope that we're going through a really nasty period because of all the all the anger around the Netanyahu and the division, and, and it's reflected stuff that's happening in other countries: Trump in America, Brexit in Britain, populism in and nationalism in Europe, but the, the basic belief of Israelis in the election is still very strong, in the electoral process is still very strong. We saw in the turnout, three consecutive elections, 70% coming out every time. The Arab community, the turnout great. So the, that, that feeling, despite everything Netanyahu has done, despite all the nasty, uh, and let let you know nasty exchange between him and Gantz and the lack of real belief and so on. You know, in in, a, in an alternative, people are still engaged, and that's why I'm still I, I'm still optimistic. And we can and we can make it happen. Right. Well, I'm going to stop you there with that very optimistic note, which is helpful given the you know clear complexities in the electoral process and the uncertainties ahead of us. But really, thank you so much, Angela, for joining us. 
Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you all. Um, and we'll be sent to the main room now.